Hey everyone, thank you for having me. And I'll focus more on uh, where we're at as an organization and, and our experience. Uh, just a bit of background, uh, Awoke was created by a collective called the Great One Eighters, which is a youth collective that began in high school. I was one of those co-founders. Um, we've carried the organization through uh, the better part of a decade and transitioned into a formal nonprofit in 2017. Um, produced uh, some efforts to be able to rehabilitate an abandoned thrift store and make it our cultural center in Canoga Park, um, and now have transitioned from a volunteer-run organization to an employee-run organization. Needless to say, we are at a different place than uh, some of the more established nonprofits out there, but uh, where we lack in years of experience, I think we make up in our uh, devotion to the work and the fact that we've been very much grounded in uh, the grassroots efforts and activities that really promote social impact. It was definitely vital for us to have a day of reckoning um, with respect to our board through our strategic planning process in which we really came up with an intentional recruitment strategy for board members. I think that cannot be stressed more than than necessary. I think uh, being really intentional about whom you want to recruit and in what fields of experience, expertise you might need them in is incredibly important. For us, uh, we were a family-run board, right? So, um, you know, one of the, the primary board members is, you know, our team mom and mom of some of our other co-founders as well, right? Um, others were folks that had seen us grow up. They've known us since we were kids. Um, and so while they might not be a uh, blood family, they're chosen family in that sense. And so as we transition into really growing operations and wanting to become a much more sustainable organization, uh, you really have to come to terms with uh, needing to really broaden that circle or the circle of trust as Cindy is calling it. Um, you know, for us, it's really making sure that this um, family established nonprofit really became a space that creates openness for leadership, for change, and for other ideas to come on board. Um, it's one thing to just stack the board with different people, different names. It's another thing to really make room for them uh, to serve in that leadership capacity. Uh, so for us, that's that's been something that's been incredibly important. Um, this organization, our organization, was started by people with lived experience. We, many of us grew up in the communities that we serve, namely in Pacuayma, the Northeast San Fernando Valley. So uh, our networks, uh, while they might be rich in culture, are definitely uh, not really uh, wealthy and or uh, connected when it comes to the traditional subject matter expertise that we might think we need on board of directors. So uh, we don't know many CPAs. We don't know uh, many bankers. You know, these, these are things that Oftentimes, um, when you uh, talk to nonprofits that they might mention, and so for us, it's a, it was a bit of a learning curve, right? Um, really not just understanding what these different fields do, but also trying to work to build relationships with folks in those spaces. Um, so again, when you're thinking as a smaller nonprofit in that transition point, I think it's really important that uh, you have that opportunity to have very difficult conversations at times about what does shared leadership look like? What does um, having folks step to the side look like? Um, you know, you're used to, especially in a transition period, you're kind of like in this state of, if, it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, but really growth requires a bit of chaos from time to time. And so you have to consider, you know, what can I do to shake things up and how comfortable can I get in this state of uncomfortability in some ways? Um, for us, uh, we've we've had some success as of late. Uh, within the last two months, we were able to recruit uh, three new board members, two of which uh, have been around uh, serving as volunteers and um, active participants in our organization. You know, it really came down to uh, one of them, uh, Jonathan Chavez. He is a DJ as well as a graphic artist for Complex Magazine. Um, so he, he knew his way around hip hop culture. And that's really where, um, you know, our organization does its best work. And so I had always come around, provided his either services for free when we were hosting events or just, you know, having a great time and being there side by side as he's seen us grow up. And uh, we never really thought to make the ask. 
you know, he was always there to, to be helpful. Um, but we never thought to make the ask like, hey, are you willing to take the lead forward and, and serve on our board? And so I think it's at times um, making that ask is something that's difficult, especially when you have an established relationship with somebody. It's important to, to take that leap of faith. Uh, the other individual is a well-established pioneer in hip hop dance. Um, and he would always come around to our events and from time to time even judge those events uh, because we do have contests and competitions always had had expressed the immense support um, and love that he had for the organization for continuing the culture. Um, again, never really thought about reaching out to him and saying, hey, as somebody who actually started this culture that we are currently trying to really push forward in our communities, would you be interested to be a part of this? I think a part of it was, you know, when you have a pioneer of the very um, art form in some ways and cultural uh, expression that you're doing, it, it can be a bit daunting uh, to make sure that, you know, you're doing it right and you're doing it justice. Um, but, you know, having him as a North Star has been extremely helpful. Uh, the third has actually come from professional connections um, on myself. I do serve um, as a manager over at the Commission on Human Relations for the county and uh, privy to various commissioners in those spaces. Um, and in, in that sense, I, I didn't necessarily make the ask. What I did was I invited folk to come participate in our events. And I think that that's something that's incredibly important to think about as a, a board recruitment tool is oftentimes we think that um, we need to kind of break bread and, and go catch, uh, get some coffee or do something like that, that that's more traditional with folks. Um, but really, when you have somebody who's on your board, you want them to really not just be interested in the mission, but be devoted to the actual work that you're doing. And so uh, one of the things that we did was really be intentional about inviting folks to our two community arts festivals. Um, and, you know, some of them didn't show up and some of them did. And what was another really great strategy for uh, the community arts festival in question that I'm talking about, a family affair, was we actually had our board of directors set up a booth there. Um, they had some information they were giving out, but they were also engaging the community at large by giving out free snow cones, something super simple, something that engaged them with participants, with families, but gave them presence at the event. And because of that, the um, individual that ended up joining our board was able to plug in, have great conversation, enjoy the fun times see participants in action and get the general vibe of the event. They ended up staying for the entirety of the event and even volunteered without um, having said that they were going to do that. Uh, so that I thought was an, an important strategy that we hadn't really considered um, at first, uh, but really lent itself to creating a force multiplier effect there. Um, I think for us, uh, just to, to bounce over to uh, something else, something that we're really exploring right now is what does youth board membership look like? And I know uh, Cindy had mentioned um, that you can have an advisory board or a junior board, as they, as some might call it, um, and that can be a place where you can have uh, youth board members. Um, one thing that we're really interested in exploring uh, is actually having a youth participant on the actual board of directors. In California, law is a bit silent with respect to um, age requirements. Other states are uh, much more um, direct with either stating that they have to be over 21, have to be over 18, or if they're 16 to 18, then the explicit mission of the organization has to be to serve people under the age of 18. Um, again, California being silent on this issue, it's important to really consult with legal counsel and something that we're doing right now is really uh, looking into what best practices for other California based organizations are, uh, because we have were established by youth. I mean, the fact that we started this when we were in high school, it's incredibly important for us to keep that lifeblood in the organization and to also make sure that this doesn't just become a, a bureaucratic mess in some ways, right? We really wanna make sure that things stay grounded in youth culture. Um, that is one of the things that we're really, really interested in delving into this year and that we're pouring in some resources to doing. Outside of that, I think for one of the, the things that I really try to get at with our board is having discussions about what does racial, economic and social justice look like in our communities, making sure that they're not just grounded in the mechanisms of the nonprofit, 
that they're keeping the eye on the prize, which is transformative justice work to really transform communities, acknowledge harms, and get us to a place where maybe our nonprofit doesn't need to exist. You know, that's, I think, the goal in mind. And oftentimes, because we're caught in this cycle and this nonprofit industrial complex, we often lose sight of why we may have actually gotten into the work. We might love what we're doing programmatically, but we don't often think about, hey, my goal should be to put myself out of business. And that should be how I double down each and every time, each and every year when I think about strategic planning. So making sure that your board of directors, while obviously keeping uh, you financially stable, uh, has that, that um, understanding. And that might not mean you as an organization disappear when a certain need disappears, you just pivot to a new mission, right? Uh, but it's having that thought in mind that's incredibly important. And that draws in leaders who are more innovative in the way they think and less uh, systematic in the way that they act in some ways. Outside of that, um, you know, I, I really do think it's important for us to ground ourselves with having boards of people who have lived experience. That also is a very difficult task. It's something that we should not just romanticize and tokenize. We have to recognize that when we involve people with lived experience, uh, we have to create space for them to learn, to make mistakes, and to feel comfortable there as well. If you just bring, uh, you know, a parent of one of the participants who has no background in nonprofit management, and your board is composed of other um, subject matter experts and professionals, that might feel very daunting. It might not feel like a very safe space to speak, right? And so now you're just using them as a token, right? You have to really work towards creating equity when you're bringing folk with lived experience on your board. You have to make room for them to grow. You have to give certain shared leadership roles with them, to them too. And that's again, where, where what Tom and Cindy mentioned about being uh, having board buddies can help because now you're working on building capacity to really help that out. Uh, for us, we started a parent booster club. Uh, we're having them engage in various different activities um, that can create a safe space for the parents who have lived experience to help support the organization and build their leadership and engage with staff as well as the board of directors. We also have an ambassadors council because as an arts and culture based organization, we recognize that there's artists and also cultural bearers out there who are very much interested and supportive of our work, but might not have the time and or capacity at this moment to join the board. You know, or, you know, plain, simple interest. They might just be super down for your cause, but don't necessarily want to throw themselves into something new because they're too busy creating. So we give them a space to be ambassadors of the organization, to serve in that advisory capacity, but we make it a little bit nicer, right? We, instead of calling it just an advisory board, we're calling it the ambassadors council because it sounds a bit more catchy to be an ambassador of an organization. And so again, you're, you're making things much more relatable and reasonable based on your uh, you know, sphere of influence as an organization. Um, lastly, I just want to say another uh, great um, resource that I usually tap into um, and I get some giggles out of it. Um, it. It might not always be suitable for work, so just consider that much, but it's Nonprofit AF. They're a great blog. Um, if you know what AF stands for, then by all means, you say it in your head because I'm not going to say it out loud, but it is nonprofitaf.com. And uh, the blog, the blogger there, Vu, uh, really keeps it real on a lot of things. And uh, I do recommend looking at some of their blogs about board relations. Um, you can Google search it. It's definitely going to give you something to laugh about. It's a good read when you're tuning down from the day. And I think it gives you um, a bit of a social justice, racial justice lens and equity lens when you're thinking about any kind of nonprofit work. I mean, the, the person really talks about all different topics within the nonprofit space, but I think it's fairly interesting what they say about the board space because it tends to be a space uh, of pretentiousness in the nonprofit industrial complex that we really need to tear down. I think oftentimes we're here propping up board members like if they're Jesus themselves incarnate, and that is not something that we should uh, be doing because that messages to our staff and our participants that they're less than. 
Um, and that can be an indirect cause. You know, you have to think about the consequences of how you distribute praise and how you uh, distribute that type of reference. So uh, keep that in mind as you proceed in board recruitment. I hope what we're sharing with y'all is helpful 